Good afternoon. My theme today is how should we study and teach theology? And this might lead us to ask what is theology? Now, if we look at the Bible, we encounter at once a striking and remarkable fact. Nowhere in the Old or New Testaments do we find the words theology, theologian, or theologize. These are quite simply not scriptural terms. By the same token, we may also note that none of the twelve chosen by Christ was educated at a theological college. <laughs> it's, only quite, it's only gradually that the term theology enters uh, Christian discourse. The word was viewed with suspicion by the apologists in the second century because for them it meant primarily the speculations of religious thinkers who were pagans. The people who rarely introduce the word theology into Christian discourse are in Alexandria. Clement of Alexandria in the late second century and then above all origin. Origen is one of, I was saying to my friends over there at lunch, Origen is one of my favorite theologians. I agree with St. Vincent of Lerin, who said, who would not rather be wrong with Origen than right with anyone else? <laughs> And significantly, it's at Alexandria that there first emerges a well-established theological college, the celebrated catechetical school, where uh, Clement and Origen both taught. Well, when theology as a word enters Christian discourse, what does it mean? In the Greek Fathers, it has rather a different sense from the one we give to it today. Lephagrius of Pontus, who was a disciple of Basil and Gregory of Nazianzus, and who then became a desert father, uh, observes in a famous epigram, if you are a theologian, you will pray truly, and if you pray truly, you are a theologian. <coughs> so certainly for the Greek fathers, there was an essential link between theology and prayer. They saw theology not just as an academic study, not just as a question of intellectual rigor, though they certainly believed in that, but they saw theology as involving a personal commitment, a commitment through prayer. In the 14th century, Saint Gregory Palamas sums up the view of the Greek Fathers on theology by saying there are three kinds of theologian. First of all, he says the real theologians are the saints, those who possess personal experience of God. Then he says there is a second class of theologians who are on a lower level, but nonetheless they are people who trust the saints and try to 
reproduce what it, the saints are saying. And such people, even if they themselves lack close personal experience of God, can nonetheless be good theologians. Then he says there is a third class of theologians, people who are not saints, who lack personal experience and do not trust the saints and they are bad theologians. <laughs> well, that reassures me. I don't claim to be a saint, but I hope that in the 35 years that I taught theology at the University of Oxford, I tried to be faithful to the message of the holy men and women who have borne testimony to their living experience of Christ. But all of this shows that theology, at any rate as the Greek fathers understood it, is not just a subject to study at university. It's not on exactly the same level as geology or some other scientific discipline because it does involve a certain personal commitment. Here is the way a contemporary Greek theologian speaks about the meaning of theology for the Greek fathers. In the Orthodox Church and tradition, theology has a very different meaning from the one we give it today. It is a gift from God, a fruit of the interior purity of the Christian spiritual life. Theology is identified with the vision of God, with the immediate vision of the personal God, with the personal experience of the transfiguration of creation by uncreated grace. In this way, he continues, theology is not a theory of the world, a metaphysical system, but an expression and formulation of the church's experience, not an intellectual discipline, but an experiential participation a communion. Now we might notice the key words there, gift, grace, personal experience, participation, communion, interior purity, transfiguration, <coughs> vision of God, Well, in a modern university, especially a secular university, and Oxford is now in effect a secular university, can you really teach theology at all, if that is what it means? I think you can, keeping in mind the idea of Gregory Palamas's second level of theologian. We can, even in a secular university, try to be faithful witnesses to what the saints have discovered and what the church has lived. Now, Following out this approach to theology, this means that theology is closely linked to mystery. The Greek fathers often talk about the mystery of theology. But let's recall the proper meaning of the word mystery whether it comes in the Bible, 
for example, in the epistle to the Ephesians, or whether it is used by Christian writers. A mystery, theologically understood, is not just an unsolved problem, a baffling conundrum. A mystery is something that is revealed to our understanding but it's never exhaustively revealed because it reaches out into the infinity of God. Now, in the theology of the Greek fathers and in modern Orthodox theology, there are two approaches which are often described as the cataphatic approach and the apophatic approach. Well, cataphatic and apophatic are two rather grand ways of saying affirmative and negative. Cataphatic approach in theology is trying to say in positive terms what God is. But this needs to be balanced by the apophatic approach, which says what God is not, which emphasizes the mystery of God, the unknowability of God, his transcendence. And anyone who wants to enter into the Eastern Orthodox approach to theology needs to keep those two words in mind. I often illustrate them by appealing to a, a little book that I have in Oxford. I didn't bring with it with me here. It is a book called Signs of the Times, and it is the result of a competition instituted by the Times newspaper in London, where people were invited to photograph puzzling signposts from different places of the world. For example, from Wales, there was a notice uh, in a car parking area that said, parking is limited to 60 minutes in each hour. <laughs> Another one came from Africa saying, uh, from a nature park somewhere in Africa saying, elephants have right of way. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, uh, one from a market in England uh, where there was a signpost saying, um, sheep go straight on, pigs turn right, and then there was narrow pointing left. <laughs> and, and the Times uh, commented that it was rather ungracious when pigs have learnt to read, deliberately to confuse their sense of direction. <laughs> anyway, two of the signposts that they photographed illustrated the difference between a cataphatic and apophatic theology. Um, first of all, there was a notice at a railway level crossing which said, if the bell is ringing, and there was a bell attached to a post, stop, look and listen in case a train is coming. If the bell is not ringing, still stop, look, and listen, in case the bell is not working. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, you see, allowed for all possibilities. <laughs> and so that could be a motto for cataphatic theology. But, there was another signpost from Australia, which simply, uh, pointing and it simply said this road does not lead 
to either Cairns or Townsville. But it didn't say where it leads to. <laughs> However, if you happen to know the geography of the place, you might, from this negative statement, derive a positive message. And that's true of apophatic theology. By making negative statements about God, you can, in fact, convey a positive message about the being of God, yet one so powerful that it can't be put in the form of direct positive statements, but has to be expressed through negations. And this is very much the way you find the Greek Fathers and the Orthodox Church today speculating in theology. Negative theology, the apophatic approach is prominent in people like Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, much loved by John Wesley, and many later authors like Dionysius the Areopagite or Maximus the Confessor. There's a phrase used by the poet T.S. Eliot, which we can apply to theology. It is a raid on the inarticulate. Father John Meyendorf, another Russian who worked here in America, says that theology is simultaneously contemplation of God and the expression of the inexpressible. Every theological statement, says St. Basil, falls short of the understanding of the speaker. Our understanding is weak and our tongue is even more defective. According to the early fathers, once theology forgets the inevitable limits of the human understanding, replacing the ineffable word of God with human logic, then it ceases to be theologia and it sinks to the level of technologia. That is why our theology has to be expressed to use Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, in a riddling, enigmatic way. We are often compelled in theology to use paradox, because we're stretching human language beyond its proper limits, in order to embrace, however inadequately, the fullness of divine truth. We find ourselves obliged to make statements that are seemingly contrary to each other. Not without reason, Cardinal Newman describes the theological enterprise as saying and unsaying to a positive effect. All of this means that we who study or teach theology should be conscious of the danger of trying to say too much. On Oxford Station, when I'm waiting for the railway train, and I walk to the far end of the platform, I eventually come to a notice which says, Passengers must not proceed beyond this point. Fine, 200 pounds. Well, perhaps we should put up a similar notice. Theologians must not proceed beyond this point. Fine, what shall we say? A very long time in purgatory. <laughs> If we study, for example, patristic theology, we will find that though the fathers discuss the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of Christ at great length, yet in the end, 
the element of mystery still remains. How can God be simultaneously both one and three? How can Christ be fully and completely God, fully and completely man? In the end, we cannot explain, though often we may choose to set aside certain manners of speaking that are inadequate. Our theological statements set a fence round the mystery, but they don't exhaustively describe it. There are three qualities that I'd like to emphasize connected with our study or teaching of theology. Three words, wonder, freedom, and community. First of all, wonder. Plato says the beginning of philosophy is to feel a sense of wonder. And I think that applies also to theology. To a lot of theology we could apply the criticism, your God is too small. Without a sense of amazement, a willingness to be surprised, without astonishment, there can't be real teaching or study of theology. This applies to all study, that the purpose of study is not to communicate information, to we who are teachers are not here to stuff facts into the heads of our pupils. A purpose of teaching, of education, theologically or otherwise, is to open our eyes to a sense of wonder. And that's what the teacher is trying to do with his pupils, not to tell them what they should think, but to say, open your eyes, look for yourself, see how amazing this all is. And if as teachers we don't succeed in communicating some sense of wonder, then we are failing in our task. I could quote T.S. Eliot again, old men ought to be explorers, he says. Well, that applies to young men and young women as well, and it applies particularly to theologians. We should be explorers. We need to feel the kind of wonder that is evoked in, for example, the book of Job, when at the end God speaks out of the whirlwind. He doesn't exactly answer Job's questions, but what he does is speak of the beauty and mystery of the creative world. And we need to have, in our study of theology, some sense of beauty and mystery. Of course, that applies also to the study of science. Scientific discoveries have not abolished the wonder and mystery of the universe. They've simply extended the horizon of that mystery making us ever more keenly aware of its vast dimensions. So there can be no authentic theology, no authentic personhood without a sense of wonder. 
But then let's take another quality linked with wonder, and that is freedom. There can be no real study, no real education, theology or anything else without a feeling of freedom. The truth will make you free, says Christ in John chapter 8. A university, a theological school, is a controlled environment for, yes, the cultivation of wonder and also the cultivation of freedom. If I was asked by my students at Oxford, what are you trying to do for us? Then I felt my best answer was to say no more than this. We want you to learn to be free. So to educate is to invite, not to command. It, Education is linked with the Latin word educere, meaning to lead forth, to draw out, to conjure up, to evoke. That's what a teacher should be trying to do. And of course that applies right through the Christian life. In a second century text, the letter to Diognetus, we find these words, God persuades, he does not compel, for violence is contrary to the divine nature. I wish Christians through the centuries could have listened more carefully to that golden saying, God persuades. He does not compel. That's true of all education and study and true particularly of theology. So while there needs to be a sense of commitment in our study of theology, there needs also to be a sense of freedom. The significance of a college as a structured environment for learning freedom is well expressed in a Jewish saying recorded by Martin Buber in his book, The Tales of the Hasidim. Rabbi Shalomo was asked, what is the worst thing that the evil urge can achieve? And he answered, to make us forget that we are each the child of a king. The child of a king and therefore free. May we never forget our royal birthright and may we carry that into all our theological work. So then, a theological school is a place for the evocation of wonder, for the learning of freedom. But there's a third element that we need to add. This wonder is evoked, this freedom is learnt, not in isolation, but through interaction with others, not in solitude, but in mutual solidarity. A theological school is communal. It's a place for a shared exploration. So that would be my third idea in the study of theology alongside wonder and freedom, community, kinonia. Here I think of one of my favorite all-purpose anecdotes. This comes from Fyodor Dostoevsky's masterwork, The Brothers Karamazov. It's a story about an old woman 
and an onion. Some of you may know it, but I'm going to tell it all the same. Once upon a time, there was an old woman. Uh, after death, she woke up to find herself, much to her surprise, in a lake of fire. Looking out on the bank, she saw her guardian angel walking along. So she called out, I am a very respectable old lady. I shouldn't be here in this lake of fire. Oh, said the angel, you think there's been some mistake? Yes, she said. Did you ever do anything to help someone else? Asked the angel. She thought for some time and then she replied, Yes, once I was gardening and a beggar came by and I gave her an onion. Excellent, said the angel, reaching into his robes. I happen to have that very onion with me now. Let us see what we can do with it. So she took the other end of the onion and the angel began to pull her out. Perhaps it wasn't an onion, but a shallot, but never mind. <laughs> um, however, she wasn't the only person inside the lake of fire. When the others saw what was happening, they crowded round, hoping to be pulled out as well. This didn't please the old woman. She began to kick and shout. She began to say, let go, let go. It's not you who's being pulled out, it's me. It's not your onion, it's mine. And when she said, it's mine, the onion snapped in two and she fell back into the lake of fire and there, so I'm told, she still is. That's Dostoevsky's story. Now, my development, if only the old woman had said, it's our onion, might it not have proved strong enough to pull them all out of the fire. But in saying it's mine, not it's ours, she was denying her essential personhood. In refusing to share, she became less than human. It's no coincidence that in the Lord's Prayer, we say, we once, our three times, us five times, but nowhere in the Lord's Prayer do we say, I, mine, or me. It's equally no coincidence that in Greek, the word poroso for person is prosopon, which means literally face or countenance. I'm not genuinely a person unless I face others, unless I relate to them, unless I look into their eyes and let them look into mine. As John McMurray, Scottish philosopher, said in his unduly neglected Gifford lectures, written some 60 or more years ago, um, uh, persons in relation. He says there is no true person unless there are at least two persons in dialogue. He says that all genuine personhood is interpersonal. And he uses the memorable phrase, I need you in order to be myself. Now, that was exactly what the old woman in Dostoevsky's story was denying. But that gives us an indication how we should study and live our theology in a Christian college. 
We are here to share our onion with one another. And there is a deep reason why this is so. We are created in the image of God. That's the most important fact about our human personhood. And in the image of God means primarily perhaps in the image of Christ. But it also means in the image of God the Holy Trinity. As the Wesleys say in one of their hymns, you whom he ordained to be transcripts of the Trinity. That's what we are, transcripts of the Trinity. And what does the doctrine of the Trinity mean? God is not just unity, he is unity in diversity. God is not just one person loving himself, he is three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, loving one another. God is not just personal, he is interpersonal. So if we are in God's image, we are called to share, to relate, to live our lives in and for others. And among other things, we should be doing that in our study of theology here in a Christian college or wherever we may be. So let's keep in mind prayer and theology, mystery and theology, and then the three qualities, wonder, freedom, and community. Thank you. this morning, of course, following out my interpretation of Dostoevsky's story, it's perhaps a good thing if we're saying the Jesus prayer to say not just have mercy on me, though that's the usual form of orthodox say the prayer, but sometimes we say it in the form have mercy on us, and that fits with the Lord's prayer. Secular person, so he doesn't believe in God. So do you believe somebody who does not believe in God can actually study theology? Yes. So the question is uh, can somebody who doesn't believe in God study theology? And we might equally ask can somebody who doesn't believe in God teach theology? I hope that. Uh, in our theological schools, it depends of course on the nature of the school, but I hope that if it is a general theological school, not specifically a school for training people for the ministry, that there would be no religious tests before admitting people to the university, that we would not ask what their private and personal beliefs were. And certainly in a place like Oxford, um, when appointing our staff to the uh, theology faculty, we would be in grave difficulties if we started asking them about their personal faith. That would be seen as an incorrect intrusion. Uh, some of our uh, teaching staff in Oxford still have to be ordained members of the Anglican, the Episcopalian Church. But in general, certainly at Oxford, uh, I would have felt theology should be open to anyone who wanted. And anyone who wished to study theology simply as a liberal arts discipline was welcome to do so. Uh, and among my own pupils, uh, certainly at the undergraduate level, I had some 
who didn't have any particular religious faith, as long as they thought the questions being asked by theology are interesting questions, that would be enough. As long as they had the sense of wonder and exploration, that would be enough. Um, <coughs> I think that if they believed that the answers given by theology, by a Christian tradition, could not possibly be true, they would be unlikely to get very much out of the study of theology. But as long as they said, we have an open mind, we don't know about the answers, but we would like to think more about the questions, then I would gladly welcome them. But I would still feel that to exist in its fullness, uh, theology would imply commitment and belief. Now, yet, we have a great deal that we can learn from writers on religious topics who may not have any explicit belief. So we should be open. I will bring in my second quality there, freedom. Other questions? Yes. Uh, what would you say are the main distinctives between Eastern theology and Western theology in general? It's always dangerous to um, <coughs> generalize, but basically the theology of the Eastern Orthodox Church still continues to be patristic. The age of the Fathers, so far as orthodoxy goes, did not end with the 5th century or the 8th century or even with the fall of Byzantium but it goes on right up to the present time and for example one of the greatest orthodox theologians in the 20th century Father George Florovsky who taught at Harvard uh, used to sum up his theological program in the words neo-patristic synthesis. So we have not had in orthodox theology the development that the West saw in the period from the 12th century onwards the rise of scholasticism. Theology in Byzantium was not taught in the universities. Uh, whereas in the West it became a university topic. So in general, Orthodox theology is less systematic than Western and more mystical in its approach. And most of the works of the Fathers are actually commentaries on Holy Scripture and many of their writings were originally delivered as homilies at the Divine Liturgy, sermons in church. Now, it's true that in more recent centuries, Orthodox have begun writing systematic, dogmatic theologies, but I think we've tended to retain much more the mystical element in theology and to stress exactly what I was mentioning, the link between theology and prayer. Um, now clearly the West, the Latin West and the Reformation West, has also a rich mystical tradition. But uh, in the later Middle Ages there tended to be a separation between the kind of theology that was taught in the schools that was highly systematic and the mystical theologians who were usually not academics. That happened in the later Western Middle Ages and perhaps is one of the factors that contributed to the Reformation. 
in the East we've always tried to avoid this kind of <coughs> division. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. was there another question? Yes, because you've already asked one. Yeah. So <laughs> let's have one from over here. I want to ask this uh, question that my students ask me every quarter when they're reading the Orthodox Way. And could you give us a contemporary example of what you mean by the figure of the fool and how that, um, that person can, uh, functions in the Orthodox tradition? Yes, I do speak briefly in my book, The Orthodox Way, um, about the fool in Christ. And this is a figure who existed in the West as well, at least up to the end of the Middle Ages. It's rather interesting how you treat uh, fools in general and fools in Christ in particular. In the earlier ages, by and large, unless people were violent and did damage to themselves and to others, they were not shut up. The society managed to live with a certain number of people who were highly eccentric and even unbalanced, and yet they were not excluded from the community. The fool was a characteristic figure at all royal courts, and he was an accepted, he had an accepted role in society. Can we continue to have fools in Christ up to the present day? And of course the fool in Christ in the Orthodox tradition um, is often someone who has deliberately adopted the path of foolishness, though the borderline between deliberate foolishness and uh, unintended madness is not a clear one at all. <laughs> I can't always draw it in practice. Um, uh, a lot of mad people are aware that they are mad and even rather pleased. That's not true of all. Um, yes, uh, the fool traditionally in Orthodox spirituality is a prophetic figure who can often say things that no one else can say, um, who has a certain freedom because he desires no position in society and so he has nothing to lose. So I think he does express in one particular form the freedom of the prophet and if we don't have fools we do need still to have prophets in our church life uh, but uh, there is a Greek saying which runs if you want to learn the truth ask a child or a fool and so the fool can often tell the truth that other people will not tell or cannot tell so I think all of this continues to be something that we need in our present day society. And if you go around at any rate to Orthodox monasteries, you will still find that fools in Christ are made welcome and uh, they exist and flourish and are loved and helped. And somehow a Christian community that has no place for the fool is losing something. So I believe this does have a contemporary value and there are people who um, uh, in our church today were certainly following this form of sanctity, a form of ultimate self-stripping where you reject all conventions in order to bear witness to the freedom of the Holy Spirit. One last question. Yes. There we have one, please. Um, how do you cultivate the heart in the midst of those? Yes. Um, we have to have a balance, of course, because if you just say freedom <coughs> in a sense of wonder, you 
aren't going to pass your degrees, your examinations very successfully <laughs> just on that alone. There has to be the hard work of study and uh, sometimes that can be a grind. None of us enjoy all the time what we have to do and um, in order to gain a sense of wonder, perhaps we have to begin by simply learning the basic facts and disciplines. You can't make bricks without straw. But I would hope that one could keep a feeling of exploration. Um, when I was teaching the history of early Christian doctrine, I tried to adopt a kind of dialectical approach, encouraging my students to get inside the mind of the different early Christian writers, trying to understand why they wanted to speak in the way they did. Not just what they said, but why did they say it? What was their inner motivation? And in the disputes between uh, the so-called heretics and the so-called orthodox, again, one would want to try and discover why the heretics, those whom the church rejected, in fact felt it necessary in, in many ways to teaching not just to give people facts, but to get them to ask who was, what were the questions that the people were asking. And then, of course, we do want to evaluate things. Why would some answers be better than others? Um, though often in a subject like the history of Christian doctrine, there are no final right answers. There is only a, an open-ended discussion. But I would like people to try to see why some answers might have advantages that others don't have. Um, in assigning people essay topics, I always tried, not always successfully, to give them questions that they couldn't answer by simply copying out passages from the book, where they had to think for themselves and express some uh, view that they wouldn't find necessarily ready-made in their books. So that would be ways in which I would want to try and keep alive a spirit of exploration. But it's easier just to teach people facts. It's, I think, much harder to make yourself and your pupils ask questions. But that's the real way we should be studying. Let's thank Bishop Lisa.